I created a wheel to describe what enlightenment actually looks like. And the, my idea is that enlightenment is a, is a state that is always churning. So once you reach enlightenment, which you do kind of have to reach enlightenment to have the churning begin. You have to taste it. Yeah, but once you taste it, you FYI can't go back. So for anyone who's listening who's like tasted it and your life has gotten worse since then, it's like, that's because mm. once you taste it, time starts. It's like almost like the mm. clock doesn't start running until you taste enlightenment. Once you taste enlightenment, the duty unfolds. Biet Simpkin is an author, a musician, and one of the most renowned meditation teachers in the world, teaching people like Russell Brand, for example. And this conversation is just beautiful. She's had a wild and incredibly interesting life. And we get to share a lot of insights. And she guides me through one of her practices, which was incredibly powerful on this podcast. So this is one not to miss with Biet Simkin. Biet, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. You too, Aubrey. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I noticed one thing when I was reading the introduction to your book is that our family has a similar history in that we fled Mother Asha. Oh, wow. My family fled Mother Asha because they were Jewish. And that was a little rough for a little while out there with the... Uh, um, <laughs> different things that were going on and uh, out there in Russia. And uh, and your family fled for a slightly different reason, although I suppose oh, no, they, they could be Jewish. Oh, no, they fled for being Jewish, yeah. But yeah. mystical <laughs> Jewish, a much more... Mis- mine yeah. was like a ha- like straight-up, normal Hanukkah, <laughs> Passover, Seder Jewish, and the pogroms were coming, you know, yeah. in, in general. Yours family was a, a far more mystical yes. Siberian shaman, yeah. you know, <laughs> play, a plant medicine Jew. yeah. Yeah, my family didn't touch any of that, but that makes me, it's really interesting, actually, that that we share that common ancestry. Very much, very interesting, because I feel like that stuff matters. I, even if, I don't think of Judaism just as a religion at all. I think mm. of it as, you know, in the same way that someone is black, someone is Jewish, like it's, it's part of your nationality. You yeah, know? yeah. One of the few, you know, one of the few things, it's both a religion and a race. Right. And I think... Uh, it's important to disambiguate both of them, but also they're often connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So tell us a little bit of that story because your upbringing actually wove in a lot of these kind of mystical experiences that your father had and the reasons why he went, he went that route. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting story that actually unpacks where you are now oh, in sure. a pretty interesting way. Yeah, sure. Um, My dad was an atheist, Marxist, a jazz musician, doctor living in communist Russia. And he was pretty miserable. He smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day. I mean, he was like a lively, brilliant, funny guy, but Mm. he was miserable on, on some level that maybe many people are when they have no spiritual kind of spark going on. And so there was no meaning to his life. Like he didn't get what was going on here. Anyway, he got tuberculosis and he was going to die. And, um, he can't, you know, he was like, holy shit, I'm going to die. And this student of his was like, I can take you to the secret person who will heal, heal you, but it's a secret. And, uh, you got to help me with my dissertation. If I, if I do this <laughs> and my dad was like, I'll do anything. Yeah. So he That's moved. also very Jewish, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, be like, and listen, save your life. Match well, my offer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. So he was like, all right, I'll do anything, which is also very Jewish. Uh, yeah. And then he like went to, uh, the woods and cured himself of tuberculosis using Ayurveda, the Torah, um, and Hatha yoga. And mm. Gurdjieffian fourth wave mysticism, which mm-hmm. is really the school of wisdom that I come from, which is what he taught. Um, and then he turned to my mom and said, hey, do you want to like bang and create a freedom child and then get the fuck out of Romantic. this country? That and is, she was like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> she said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there, here I am. And I, right. am free, I am freedom child. And they immigrated here in 79. I was born a month later. And then my life was obviously riddled with tragedy. And it was very, like, I remember this doctor, we were, you know, part of this Russian Jewish community growing up. We like summered with this bungalow colony and all the stuff and the Catskills. And um, I just remember um, this doctor that my dad was friends with. My dad was always friends with doctors because he was a medical doctor in Russia. So like everyone who fled, 
he was friends with was like doctors, dentists, whatever, you know, that whole genre of people. Mm -hmm. And so this doctor was like, your dad was handed like a really bad hand, you know, because things just got really, really hard at around when I turned six is when things got hard. And then it was just, uh, yeah, it was just us after that. Mm. You, uh, I think because of these challenges that happened in your childhood, you know, you had kind of a wild youth, I guess you could say. And I, I noticed the parallels in looking at the introduction of your book, Don't Just Sit There, with you talking about the the myth of Forrest Gump, the parable of Forrest Gump, yes. which I never saw it that way. And I don't really like the movie Forrest Gump. But now that I now that I read your introduction, I was like, oh, what a great story. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. But you've also had your own kind of mythic hero's journey, you know, kind of moving out of your contact with your spiritual essence and everything that you've known and then finding your way back having gained all of the wisdom of your journey along the way. So I don't know if those two stories weave together in any way in your mind or whether you'd like to tell them separately, but I'd love to have you share both of those, the, the myth of Forrest and, uh, and the myth, myth of Biet as well. Well, the, the myth of Forrest, and that, it can be applied to pretty much any real film. Like that, that's a thing that I use, like a diorama that I use to mm-hmm. create the mythology of if a character is truly free in a film, when you watch a film, like I was recently watching Annie, the musical with my daughter, she's four. And um, Annie is not a person. Like if you really watch Annie, Annie is is the soul. Like think about it. I, I don't know if you've ever seen Annie, but Annie is, she's an orphan. She has no parents, right? Like the soul has no parents. Right. Um, or someone's missing. The dad's missing. The mom, Like someone's always missing. And, or they're an orphan like Harry Potter. And in Annie's case, she's perfect. She's always optimistic, even though she's a poor orphan living in an orphanage, surrounded by poverty with no hope for ever finding her parents. And then somehow by way of this endless optimism and belief and faith, she finds Daddy Warbucks and wins him over and becomes his daughter. And at the end of the movie, Daddy Warbucks and Annie are dancing together and I, I forget exactly how the song goes. I but... also never knew that Daddy Warbucks was a character from Annie, but I've heard people say, yeah. oh, Daddy Warbucks over here. Yeah, <laughs> he's know? like basically like Blo- if Bloomberg was a character. He's like yeah, Bloomberg, yeah, sure. except if Bloomberg was like a total... Great name, by the way. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy Warbucks. Daddy Warbucks, <laughs> I mean, that's a stroke of brilliance. Yeah. Whoever came up with that. Good writing for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So the song is like, together again, together forever. And it's all about how they found each other, Annie and Daddy Warbucks. And so to me, like Daddy Warbucks is an angry, lost, rich, confused businessman who doesn't know how to really remember who he truly is. And Annie is this perfect, optimistic, ever-loving soul. And that's our journey is our journey is to like match those two parts of ourselves. I am both Daddy Warbucks and Annie. I am not. I think my whole life and my journey looking for enlightenment, I thought one day I'll be like Annie. I'm going to be perfect and like always optimistic and always kind and always see the bright side of life, always singing. And it never happened. And finally, I was like, maybe enlightenment isn't you know, this fucking thing. Maybe it's a, it's the marriage of this gross, kind of like angry, broken, dying man or woman, part of me, and like this ever effervescent soul that I am. Mm-hmm. And that marriage has been my journey. So that's the story of Forrest Gump is like this l- romance between the machine, which is what it's called in Fourth Way, which is the human body, the mind, and this the mortality part of us mixed with that soul part of us. Mm -hmm. That's that. And then in terms of my childhood, everyone died. And I grew up in, you know, the tenements of Queens and no money. And, you know, what we did have, though, was like a grand piano and an endless book supply. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said. There's real wealth in that. There's wealth. Yeah. Like when I was nine, my dad was like, here's the entire collection of Sigmund Freud and Carl Gustav Jung. You're nine. You seem like you're ready for this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I read all of it, you know? And I I read Eric Fromm and I studied Carlos Castaneda when I was like 11. Like, who does that, you know? But yeah, we had no money and we had no resources, but we always had caviar and vodka, books, (laughs) and a grand piano. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
just to touch back on that, on the, you know, using forest in the same way that you talked about, Annie, there's, there's this kind of, um, unlimited optimism and belief in oneself that actually isn't even belief in oneself. I think a lot of times we just, we think of belief as like you set your intention, you grit your teeth, you work hard and you keep that vision in mind. It's a very masculine kind of sports oriented, (laughs) business oriented idea. And Mm. for Forrest, he just kind of does it because he doesn't believe he can, Mm. you know, and it's almost in this inspector gadget way where he's not, not bumbling into it, but also he's just not restricted by the limitations of what our mind and what the social constructs and contracts that we have would say. And so it allows him to accomplish unbelievable things. It also puts him in places where synchronicity is happening in an astronomical way, like a, an unbelievable magical way. And of course, when we are tapped into our soul, these synchronicities happen just like that. And we're able to actually move through life in this, in this really remarkable way and and seeing that whole seeing that whole film in that regard it was like oh yeah this is a story of this is the story of how the soul works it's just when you let the universe weave your life you know and you're you're unique forest was a unique being but also the universe because his soul was open the universe was able to make contact and weave his life in these interesting ways and he didn't have any part of him that said no no And that's, it's unattainable. It's aspirational, I would say, for most of us. But it's it's really cool to now have that kind of aspiration of like, can you step into forest consciousness? Can you step into any consciousness? Yeah. And and make that a choice. Make that one of the things that you can do. And that's, I think that's what was missing for me in my, in my feel from Forrest Gump was like, it was too easy for him. And that's what I felt like. It was like everything was easy. He had like, he had like the cheat code, you know, like I want to see someone have to fight for it and struggle for it. But I didn't see it from a mythopoetic Mm -hmm. standpoint of like, oh, no, no, no. This is telling us a a lesson about the soul and about how actually not that in the entirety of his life was easy because there was a lot of other people who didn't choose the soul around him that made his life more difficult and war and a variety of different things. Yeah. But nonetheless, like, what he did was easy for him. Right. And I think that's also another kind of important lesson. Like if you're really like riding with your soul, it it can be easy, even in the midst of war and pain and heartache and, you know, your love dying and all of this, like it's beautiful. I appreciate you unpacking that. Oh, thank you. I think one thing I'll add too, because it's just so beautiful as I'm hearing you talk about it is, is how painful it was on some level. Yes, it was easy for him, but he has a mental disability and he's unattractive to the woman that he loves. Yeah. And, um, and it's heartbreaking. And I, I do think there's something about the word disadvantage when I think about the soul. I think about to choose the soul sets you at a seeming disadvantage. It's like a seeming disadvantage. Like, mm-hmm. And that's the trick of it, is like to choose your soul as your guidepost in life is going to seem like a disadvantage. So most people aren't really going to take that route because it's like, well, I don't want to, you know, whatever. It tells like it's like a veneer. It's like, you, you're not going to get the girl. You're not going to get the kid. You're not mm-hmm. going to get the house. You're not going to get the money because the soul is like, this totally, it's a smoke and mirrors, right? Mm. But then if you go like the business route, it's like, you're going to get that shit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's kind of like the lie is always much, seems much easier, right? And there's some truth to that. You won't get the girl or get the guy unless the girl or the guy is attracted to your soul. Right. And this is like such an important thing that I try to try to impress upon people is like, what, what lure are you trying to use? Right. You know, like, what's your lure? Because you'll catch a fish depending on the lure that you're using. Mm. But if you're using money as a lure, you're going to get a fish that wants to eat money. You know, or if you're, if you're <laughs> right. using beauty, you're going to use get a, catch a fish that's attracted to be Like, if you're using mm. your true, authentic self, your unique self, your soul, mm. then you're going to catch someone, male or female, yeah. that is attracted to your soul. Like, 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 I don't think people understand that. They're just like, I just want to get the fish. 
well, what fish? You right. know, like, which one? Do you want the soul attracted fish? Because that's the, that's the one that's going to make you happy. Because then it's then you're allowed to just share your radical authenticity. And the more of it you share, the more of it they're going to love. They're like, gobble, gobble, gobble. So like, give me more soul. So you know, and, and that's that's the lesson. And, and for Forrest, you know, his, uh, what was his partner's name? In Jenny. That? Jenny. Of course, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> Good impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny didn't didn't want, wasn't interested in the soul quite yet no. until she was actually faced with that moment that comes for all of us at some point in our life and sometimes earlier than others where death comes close. Yeah. You know, and that's another Castaneda teaching, right? Like like death is your use death as your ally and ask death, has it touched me yet? And like this whole whole kind of whole different uh different way in which castaneda talks about it but there's so many histories from the stoic histories to the bushido codes is the everything like we understand that death can actually change things and get you in touch with something more and that's what of course what happens is finally jenny in contact with death is able to choose the soul Mm. amen amen thanks for reading the chapter yeah i'm really grateful that i did you know, because that's, uh, it's something that's, you know, forest consciousness is like, it's something that'll be in my own kind of lexicon of understanding. So in your own life, you've then in some ways made that journey where you were chasing fame, you know, popularity, physical, physical pleasure. And I think one of the beautiful parts of what you're you know, what I understand from what you teach is it's not a turning away from all of those things. It's an include and transcend model of like, no, 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 all that's cool, but let's include and transcend it, layering in a level of mindfulness that overrides and witness perspective that overrides your daily life, whatever that daily life might be. Oh, for sure. I mean, also it's, it's not up to like up to us, right? Like some people are called to monkhood, they're called to give up their belongings and turn away from possessions and desires. And I just never had that calling. And and I'm interested, I'm fascinated by monkhood. And I'm, you know, I think it's delicious when I step into an ashram and I can spend some time there. But at the, at the end of the day, um, today I wouldn't run, run screaming out of an ashram like I did when I was a full-blown alcoholic. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I still don't feel like it's my home. My home is this world, and it's dirty, this world. It's fucked up, and people are messy in it. Um, I love that. So to me, bringing those worlds together, and I think you're doing that as well. You know, you're bringing the worlds together. That's what not just turns me on, but that's what I was told was right. what I was here to do. Right. Ex- explain to me what. Gurdjieff's role was in kind of unpacking this because I'm I'm rather unfamiliar with his work and and you credit him obviously with this fourth way yeah. teaching which is very much about that as far as I understand it right yes yeah uh, Gurdjieff was you know he he was a seeker he went down to India he studied with the Sufis and then he brought the wisdom that he gathered back up to Russia and then was in like created a cult in the woods. I don't know exactly where, but in in Russia in the beginning of the last Mm -hmm. century. And there they practiced all these very difficult techniques, some of which were movingly centered. So it included dancing, like very difficult dancing. Like the whirling dervishes or? No, it was different. Gurdjieffian dances are like, to be honest, way harder, you know, from the stuff I've studied. It's like almost impossible to do. And then there was the other centers, all the work that I teach and the work that I've been studying my whole life incorporates, you know, sitting in contemplative meditation that involves communication, which is very different. So like I learned to meditate in a way that forced me to actually speak while I meditated. Mm. So when I first started doing that on a regular basis, it was really hard for me. And one of the rules of fourth way teachings, if you actually work inside of a school system learning it, is you're not allowed to speak unless that's happening for you. Mm. So a lot of time is just spent sitting there in silence because you're like, well, I can't, I can't do the thing that's being asked of me. And then after like, you know, a period of time, it comes to you how to do it. 
okay, I can see, I can use my moving center and my intellectual center and my instinctive center and my higher intellectual center. Like I can move these centers and then I can speak while I'm in a state of presence. So, is this like a running inner monologue or is this speaking? What, like, what are you speaking? No, you're speaking like in a group. Like, let, for instance, like it would start like a in conversation. a conversation. Yeah. Like, so if you, if you came to me and I was doing one of my meetings, a fourth way, a traditional fourth way meeting, let's say there was seven or 12 of us sitting in a circle, people who were there would be asked to not speak unless they were in a state of presence. So you pause before you speak. It's not dissimilar from the Quaker um, uh, traditions in Quaker churches. I don't know if you've ever been to a Quaker no, uh, surprisingly, I haven't been to a Quaker church. Super beautiful, yeah. super beautiful. Uh, people are allowed to speak when they feel like taken by the energy oh. of God um, to speak. And so oftentimes in Quaker churches, there's nothing said. It's just a, a candlelit room with people sitting in silence. It's different with Gurdjieffian work, or at least the way that I was taught it through my father's lineage. And then later I found, after my father passed away, I found another teacher who also passed away and similarly was a crazy, drunken, sexaholic like my father, which I guess I was, that's the only kind of man I was willing to learn <laughs> from at that time. Uh -huh. But he, but he was touched and, and enlightened similarly to my father. You can be enlightened, FYI, and be super flawed apparently, you know, sure. but, um, you know, for me, the journey was like, how can I actually do this in a way that has integrity and not sleep with my students and not, you know, drink a bunch of vodka? You know, how can I, I'm just going to play with that. Like, and see, mm -hmm. you know, see what comes out on the other side. But yeah, so we'd sit in a circle and people do share, but it's about opening your heart center. So you speak from your heart rather than speaking from your head or being like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've been to Texas. You've been to Texas? Oh, me too. Totally. Like, you know, mm. people usually speak on automatic. They're not like actually pausing enough to dig what the universe or God or whatever you want to call it would say through them. They're just saying what they would say. Yeah. Which is it. super boring. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, this may be the worst idea for a podcast of all time, but I kind of want to try it. Okay. And so I don't know how we would set it up. And, and I apologize to anybody if this creates the most boring 10 <laughs> minutes of podcasting of all time. It's very possible that that could be the case. But I want to I see if we can like, I just want to just see if we can get a taste of what that might, what that might be like. Okay. Okay. So, well, let me teach you what I would do if yeah. we were in the meeting. Right. Well, first, so I founded a breathwork system. I don't know if you're familiar with that part of my teachings. Uh, not your breathwork. Very familiar with breathwork, though. No, yeah. no, of course. I meant yeah. my system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's start by doing the breath, and then we'll move into a Sufi eye gazing, which is also part of the guided by Biet process, which is what I would do inside of a circle, which means like left eye gazing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've done mm -hmm. before. Okay. So we'll start with the breath, and then we'll move into the gazing, and then we'll go from there. So if you feel called to say something at that point, just make sure that you're speaking from a place of complete presence or don't say anything yeah. at all. Right. Cool. And we can make the topic um, because it's good to have a topic or a focus. Enlightenment. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So the breath goes like this. You might want to back up a little bit from your seat. Um, we're not doing the full version, which is on the floor. So you'll still have to keep the microphone oh, okay. a little bit closer to That's you. That's fine. I can, I, I've done this in every <laughs> arena <laughs> yeah, yeah. at this point. So, um, we're not doing the floor version, which is more intense and okay. we can do that either later or at another time. But this version gets you high, but it won't get you as high to the point where you may fall over, faint, black out. For anyone listening, this breath work that I guide has the tendency to make people fear death, feel like they're going to die, worry that I'm about to abduct them into a cult. Like there are many, many feelings that may occur and very quickly. So if you're at home trying this, like make sure there's soft things around you, make sure that, you know, you're not driving mm -hmm. and trying this breath work. You could black out and crash. So just to be safe, giving that. <laughs> okay, so hands are going to come up like this and you're going to inhale through the mouth. 
And then you're going to exhale through the mouth like this. And you really want to suck in a lot of air when you go in and suck out, like blow out when you come out. We'll mm -hmm. do three of those. Yeah. On the fourth one, just watch me and then we'll do it together. The fourth one is inhale all the way up, hold the breath, puff the belly out like you're pregnant. In my case, I actually am pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then Cheating. I'm going to... Yeah. No. <laughs> and then elongate the chin to look at the ceiling above you. So it'll look like this. Hold the breath, belly out, chin up. Hold the breath, hold the breath, hold the breath. And then we'll hit the chest lightly on the heart center, releasing the air as you hit the chest. Make okay. sense? Okay, cool. So yeah. the first three are just in and out deeply. Yeah. And the th fourth thing I'll say is just relax your body. Like this isn't a physical, this isn't hatha yoga. This mm -hmm. is an astral body effort. Mm -hmm. So it's going to make you high, not by you. So you just want to like jello your body yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's do a couple of rounds of those. Okay. So just relaxing. And you can keep your eyes open. It'll help you to, you know, maintain stability. And begin. Inhale one. Release. Inhale two. Release. I'm holding onto the table, see, so I don't fall. Inhale three. And release. And then four, hold at the top. Belly out, chin up. Hold the breath. And then hit the chest. Release. And then just come to look at me in between. Left eye, this is mine. And notice how you're remembering yourself. Let's do another round. Setting an intention before we begin, hands together in prayer. Just asking the universe, God, whatever the hell you want to call that thing, to be with us today, to enter into this room, into our hearts, into our bodies, and to open up a new opportunity with this breath work and this union of you and I coming together and everyone who's joining us today. Begin. Inhale one. Release deeply. Inhale two. Release. Three. Relax more. Release. And the fourth one. Hold at the top. Hold the breath. Belly out. Chin up. And hit the chest release. Again, coming back to my left eye. The light is everywhere, mm -hmm. but hidden. Yeah. In plain sight. Hildegard von Bingen. The light wants to be seen. Desperately. It's everywhere and in everything. Yeah. 
It's painful that I don't see it sometimes. Isn't that a beautiful pain, though? Yeah. I wouldn't choose any other planet today. And I've lived on the ones where there is no pain. Yeah. I choose this place. Me too. When you notice the light, it gets stronger. Or you get more perceptive. Both. Everything changes. Your face, the walls, the air between us. Everything always changes. And some things always stay the same. Sometimes there's no words just because the beauty is so intense. Mm -hmm. And this is why this work is so yummy, because it silences us, makes us feel like we actually remember so much there's nothing to say. But if we're lucky, we can bring that opulent flower back to the planet with us. Mm. And if we're really committed, we'll come here often enough so we have something to bring. One who does not come here has nothing to bring. I want to spend more time in the heart garden. Picking and smelling flowers of light. Did you ever read the Celestine Prophecy? I haven't. At the end of the book, they all disappear. And I have found that this work does that. Sometimes I'll be in a session with someone or with a group, and everyone will just disappear. You're disappearing right now. Mm. Same. I feel my obligation as a podcaster starting to rise. (laughs) And I think it was okay, but I'm going to steer us out of this. Great. Even though it would be lovely to stay for longer. But uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted to taste it and feel it. and, And I did. So thank you. Sure. Well, now you can testify that it's real. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, it's just theory, you know. And, yeah. It's like, <laughs> like, yet gets you as high as psychedelics. It's right. like, uh, I don't believe that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Such a, such a powerful, such a powerful practice. And so this is, this is your adaptation of, of Gurdjieff's work. Yeah. Yeah. And he kind of innovated the breathing technique. Um. No, I mean, it's derived from Sufi and Indian traditions. Okay. And I worked with my father on it. And then I found another very, very special healer that did this breath with me after my father. My father, when he died, he left me with people. Yeah. You know, he left me with, he did not leave me alone. Yeah. I was guided to the perfect people, invisible teachers who were here to help me bring this to the world. Mm-hmm. There's it just it makes me realize how much is there and from all of these different lineages, you know, that it's just under the surface and you, and you, you think you understand the surface of the lineage, but there's nothing at the surface, but the artifice and, and the mirage, but really at the depth is where the real substance is. Tell me more. What do you mean? 
well, if this comes from Sufism, right? Like, how did Rumi have the contact with God and the great beloved like that? How? Like, what, what did he, did he spin around? Maybe, maybe. Maybe he did this. Maybe he did this. Like, but some, you know, some mechanism, ostensibly all they drank was wine. If, you know, as, as we're talking right. about, no, like psychedelic or psychotropic right. cocktails, you know, so they had some wine, but you could you feel it. It's pouring out of every word. Pouring. Right. So either he was born a mystic and Hafiz and all of, but and they were just born mystics. I don't believe that. <laughs> so there must have been a way and a practice and, and something that they, a path that they took to actually get there. And so like, while we can reap the fruits by tapping into the consciousness of the work, like what was underneath the surface? How did it actually, how did it actually produce such magnificent beings? Hmm. And that's, you know, that's very interesting to me because in, even in, in Judaism, right? I mean, you can understand Judaism as a religion and a, Ari Shafir did a great comedy special about Judaism, the religion, as we know it. And when I'm studying, like, the deep wisdom of Solomon Kabbalah. Hmm. And, like, big difference. Big difference. Very big. And same with, I think, all of these different traditions. is that There's, like, a hidden, you know, underneath tradition, almost like the mystery school version of everything. Same with Christianity and the kind of Gnostic teachings. Oh, and, yeah. And Rosicrucian, like, Christian exactly. conception, all of it. Yeah. Exactly. There's just, like, levels. And it's like, can you see your way through the maze? In a certain in a certain regard. In the fourth way work that I teach, there's this idea that truth is like a matrushka doll. Mm-hmm. So like a real truth. Like there's all kinds of information in the world. Most of it is not a matrushka doll. Most information is just what you see is what you get, right? So the difference between that and say the Bible or the Quran or the Torah or Rumi poetry or the work of Marcus Aurelius. The difference between, or Shakespeare, the difference between conscious work and regular work is that conscious work is like a matrushka doll. You know the matrushka dolls? Yeah, sure. Right? So the idea is that there's the big plump matrushka doll on the front. So if you look at the Bible, the Bible is like a bunch of words. It says some really literal things like, you know, rain came down and all the children were murdered, right? Like Mm -hmm. there's facts seemingly right in the bible it's like if you look at it literally one could read the bible literally and just say well a bunch of firstborn children were killed and you know don't fuck in the ass yeah variety of different yeah they they tell you just very literal yeah Yeah, exactly and that's the chubby matrushka doll right but as you start to open them real works of conscious art that's the beautiful thing fairy tales or something Forrest Gump is something. Right. It's like, you can look at it, it's like a, it's a film about a mentally challenged guy growing up in the South who's kind of lucky. That's mm-hmm. the, the big fat Matrushka doll of that movie. Yeah. But if you start to use this work to see the underlying layers, you get to that tiny Matrushka doll. And I would say the tiny Matrushka doll is what we just did yeah. together. And I do believe that that is what Rumi was doing. I do believe that's what Shakespeare was doing. I do believe that any conscious being was doing some form of this work. And I don't think you have to be Christian or Jewish or any lineage to get it. You just have to be willing to open the Matrushka doll and yeah. like get to the core. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's so the people who are, you know, transmitting this work have their own work that they've done to actually be able to transmit it. And I think a lot of times you can get lost in, at least I can, um, I can get lost in, did they mean to have this multi-layered truth behind it? Did they, were they conscious of how wise they were being when you read this, not as literal, not as the plump matrushka, but as, as you distill it down to the real underneath truth. But in a way, the, that truth speaks through the person, even with their conscious participation or not. Right. And like, so the art is actually speaking a truth, whether they were aware that it was speaking that truth or not, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's also something that's, that I've found makes it easier for me to say like, oh, man, this is, because otherwise it's like, this is so genius. And they were really that genius, but they never talked about it literally. They just only wrote in stories, but potentially their genius was felt and known by their soul and, and transmitted in a way they weren't even aware of it themselves 
Right. And, and, and it's, but it's still all there. And that's why it's yeah. a great story or that's why it's a great myth or a great movie. Mm. I mean, I would guess this is just my guess, but I don't, I don't know. I feel like when that truth comes through me, I feel like I'm literally having sex with the universe. Right. So I believe that these people felt that feeling. Yeah. That sex with the universe feeling. And I feel like there's a feeling that it's like lightning. Like you feel like you're on fire when it's happening to you. Mm -hmm. And then there's this duty to, the work is also the duty of sharing it. So like, you know, people think, okay, I'm going to go find enlightenment. And then what, right? Uh, Like how much goes into you making this podcast? The people, the finances, the rooms, the beautiful flowers, the emails, the spreadsheets, the, you know, the financial documents, the expense, the accountants, the blah, 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 right? And so for you to actually have that lightning experience where you remember who you are, that's great. That's, that's fucking daisies, you know, fucking the universe. I'll take that any yeah, day. But true. what they don't tell you is like, once you fuck the universe, then you, you know, you, you're like Moses, like you get signed up for shit. They're like, okay, now you got to come down the mountain. Yeah. And I know you have a speech impediment, but <laughs> you have to like read the 10 commandments to yeah. everyone. And then you, but you know, it's like, what? Like it's, it comes with a price. It comes with a duty, you know, like, mm-hmm. and I, I get to fuck the universe. Like I fuck my soul. Like I'm married to my soul Mm. today. I'm married to a man today. And both of us are bilaterally married to that thing. Mm -hmm. We do it together. I, and the idea that I would marry a person today and be like, you, you're responsible for my happiness, for this, that, and the other sounds nuts to me. Cause Mm. I'm like, I'm only married to this thing, but you know, you can hang out with me. We can make babies. We can like buy Mm. houses and like travel the world, but we're married to something else, you know? Mm. This is so my wife and I have gone through and we've gone through two out of a three series of weddings. Mm. And so we're kind of reimagining because mm. I found most wedding ceremonies and honestly, no offense, but most weddings to be hollow in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, like, and same with funerals. It's not just weddings. It's a lot of these different ceremonial occasions that it's like, all right, where's, we're out and we're in the outer layer of the doll here, but we desperately need to get into the inner layers. You know, yes. we need to find what's really there. Mm. And it's the same with most holidays as well. And, and I really want to reimagine and make these things meaningful. You know, like what's the, what's the real, real substance there? So for the marriage, the first one was the legal marriage. And there's a lot of reasons to get the legal marriage, the names, the yeah. finances, the, you know. And so we just did that with Elvis in Vegas. And we're like, <laughs> we were with our friends, you know, Elvis married us, you know, it was, it was a blast, you know, it lasted, it took like 30 minutes and fully lope and just had a, just had a blast with it. It was during, during the first part of COVID. So just went and did that. Mm-hmm. Second marriage. Now, second marriage was really powerful. And it was at Burning Man this past year. Mm-hmm. And this was us marrying our soul expression as embodied, you know, through this life. So our articulated soul expression, not the kind of one taste, you know, true self that's where everything disappears. But us, like mm-hmm. our unique self, our highest, our highest articulation of ourself. And we married that version of ourself, which actually our playa names are actually a reference to us at our very best, mm. you know, our own king and our own queen in this plane. And it was absolutely stunning. And I just let spirit move through me to kind of officiate it. And my dear sister, Caitlin, you know, read this unbelievable poem that came through her that same morning. And then everybody just kind of mm. spoke from the heart in, in this very similar way, not as ceremonial in this, in the context of how we did it, but it was exactly that. Like you share as spirit moves through you and we had our own sacraments that we moved around and and had this whole experience wow incredibly powerful and actually called us to another level of commitment you know it wasn't just the the basic commitment it was like oh no no our souls our unique self is in union together now (laughs) and but we still hadn't done like a proper wedding where our families could come to it and whatever. And there's been like a lot of resistance mm. from me from doing this because that reminds me of so much of the shallow wedding ceremony that I've seen all the time. And so I've been really in contemplation and meditation about what 
this third wedding would be. And what I realized is this third wedding is both of us marrying God mm. and sharing in that, in that greater union of our, you know, the highest, our highest spiritual self. And it's both of us marrying God together. Amen. And that's, and it's exactly what you're just describing, right? And that's, yeah. that's the way, because then it, then it turns us so that we're both facing a truly shared horizon, mm-hmm. you know, and, and in that shared horizon, so what my teacher, you know, Dr. Rabbi Gaffney, he talks about role mate, soul mate, whole mate, and the whole mate mm-hmm. is, is a final version where actually you soulmates are looking deeply into each other's eyes and say like show me everything sweetheart i love you no matter what you know like here we are yeah and then whole mate is where you say you know you grab each other by the hand and you face a shared horizon that's together and, and that's that's the that's the third wedding and it's yeah. and now we're moving through Being all your rabbi sounds like we're we have a lot in common <laughs> yeah no doubt <laughs> no doubt no doubt so it's cool to hear you share that i've never i haven't really heard anybody else talk about it in that way but that's you know certainly the path that i've been guided to amen yay that's the only kind of marriage that i'm clear works yeah yeah and and i think each level is you know include and transcend the first one is kind of the role mate level and in the role mate level it's like all right you know your wife i'm husband we're combining our you know, assets, but you'll have these general responsibilities. I'll have these general responsibilities. I'll do this for you. You know, right. I'll cook, you'll clean, you'll we'll, we'll yeah. figure this out, whatever. And it's great. Yeah. And important because we're, li- we have bodies and we do things. Yeah. The second one was that true, like soulmate, like, you know, show me everything. And I love everything about you, no matter what, like mm. don't hide a single thing because that's just denying me the privilege of being able to love that thing and to show you how lovable that thing is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it's that level, and then yeah, and now we're getting ready for that for that third level, and each one like calls forth a different initiation. Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. So how is that? You, so you're in this process yourself with your husband. I don't know too much about your family. Apologize yeah. about that. I could have okay. potentially done more research. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, so you're in you're in a relationship of this kind of flavor mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, very much. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also beautiful, you know, like I I fucked up, you know, like I spent my whole life finding soulmates like you spoke about and soulmates are like the for anyone listening like the worst kind of partner <laughs> ever you know if, yeah. like if i see someone who's well today i transform i alchemize soulmates so if i meet someone who's a soulmate today i ask myself what else can we create together other than like a really destructive sexual <laughs> encounter <laughs> mm-hmm. um and so like i've gotten a lot a lot of shit done but um <laughs> But back in the day, you know, like I just was really lost and, you know, I was lucky to have been taught that love is everything. And I, I didn't know about like, when you're looking for a partner, you should really see like, who are their parents and like, how much money do they make? And like, think about the, you know, what school, did they go to an Ivy League school? Like no one taught me that shit. My dad was like, if you love someone you fuck them (laughs) and then you know you will find the one like that was how i you know so i was just like your dad no my dad was i love your dad my dad was amazing your dad's going on my altar he he was a real he was he was buried as a as a sadik you know so your rabbi will know yeah it's the highest yeah Yeah. spiritual master yeah so he's the real i can tell Yeah, he was I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> transmitted. But I just, so I took that to mean, you know, kind of, so I would just like go to parties and be like, oh my God, like I found my soulmate, you know. So I dated like half the models in New York and, you know, just, it was total insanity. And so by the time I actually came to my spiritual awakening, which was like at 29, it was not like at 29, it was at 29, which for anyone who's like into astrology or whatever, Saturn returns to the exact sp- point in the sky where it was when you were born. So even if you're not into astrology, Saturn yeah, returns. Cycle. Yeah, it's a cycle. So I like woke up and within six months, I think, or, or, or immediately I met my husband. And then within a year we were together. Mm. And we've been together for 13 years. And I think that the reason that we, you know, grow so much and, and last, I don't think necessarily that's so long. It feels long to me, 13 years to be with one human being. But I just think, 
the reason we are so, you know, blossoming is because of this understanding. Like we both have um, a God of our own understanding and we devote ourselves to that light and then we give to each other. So if you think about it, it's like receiving and giving, like we are receivers to give. Yeah. So if I'm always receiving from God and giving to my husband, and if my husband's always receiving from God and giving to me, that's a whole lot of giving mm -hmm. to each other, right? Yeah. So there's not a lot of lack, but I'm not looking to have him do something for me. Right. I know where my source is. He knows where his source is. And so we're never deprived. And I think of when people marry each other, and don't realize that they need to marry whatever you want to call God. I'm not even religious. I just believe in my own version of that, right? Well, so I think like, when you know God, it's hard to be religious. <laughs> it's really hard yeah. to be religious. Like, okay, I'm going to show up on yeah. Sunday and yeah, exactly. follow the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or Saturday or whatever. So, yeah, like the, the receiving portion, it's like, that's the juicy thing is being able to know where to get my shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm lost, if I'm confused, if I'm down, I know where to go. Yeah. In, in a way, you know, your fa it's almost like your father's advice was he potentially took it literally himself. And so I don't want to. Yeah. But also there's the Matryoshka doll effect of that advice, which is like you fuck them. Well, yeah. fuck could mean with your body but it could mean going deeper into the layers, like fucking into their spirit, into their, and then ultimately fucking the light behind everything. Yeah. Like all the way. And so using your partner as a gateway to access the great beloved, to access source, but knowing that actually it's transcending, including and transcending your partner. And then actually as you're fucking your partner, you're fucking God as your partner. Yeah. You know, and like that's the that's what the the deepest, you know, part of the Matryoshka is, is when you realize that, you know, wow, like thank you for being this doorway, you yeah. know, for me to access the divine in a way that I could really feel it because sometimes the divine is it's ephemeral by its very nature and and it's embodied in in the plants and our food and our and yeah. our wine and our lovers and our you know, and I think this is this is kind of the the way that it's easier for us to find the divine. Sometimes we can get unmediated access to the great one divine, you know, emanation and presence or some archangel, you know, representation yeah. or archetype of it that comes to us in a variety of different ways. I've certainly had a lot of those experiences, but my favorite way to access it is access it through the intimacy or eros that's created from the connection with people and yeah. experiences that happen on this, in this, in this world. Same. Yeah. And that's, a, that's another big part of this, you know, whole philosophy, which is to find, it's almost in a way, it's like find God in everything. It's kind of what you're saying. I mean, your intro video on your website is like, you know, I went from sex, drugs, and rock and roll to meditation actually sex drugs and rock and roll is meditation and it's yeah. like it's it's collapsing the duality of this is holy and sacred and this is not inherently and saying like well it depends you could be sitting in a church pew and it could be the most profane thing you've ever done because you're pretending to yeah. access god and all you're doing is showing how good you are to your neighbors which is the antithesis of divine yes. or you could be you know, in the middle of an orgiastic experience, but so mm -hmm. filled with the fuck of life and God that mm -hmm. actually you're in worship and prayer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, that's absolutely the way I understand the world. Same. Yeah. And I, I think it's also both, and they're both, they aren't what they seem. So right. it's like, yes, yeah, sex, drugs, and rock and roll are a real easy shortcut that lead to the destruction of one's life. In my case, they destroyed my life. You know, the house burnt down, the baby died. Lots of shit happened that showed me that that was not the way for me. Mm -hmm. When I So then, of course, you get afraid, right? So for anyone listening, it's like, oh, you're saying that I can't have sex and drugs and rock and roll. It's like, no, you can have all that stuff. You just, you, you got to surrender yourself first. You yeah. can't have it. Right. You got to disappear. And then it can have its way through you. Like the whole point of us living is so that the universe can experience how great life is through us. Yeah. So if we're doing it our way, 
the universe is not getting its fill. We got to do it its way. So it's kind of a listening. It's like a radio. It's like, turn it on. Be like, what do you want me to do? Yeah, you get out of the way to get in the way, actually. Yeah. You know, it's like dissolve all of the false constructs of our separate self, you know, creation that we have, which is, which is gorgeous, whatever. It's beautiful. We all have our own separate self and our ego. There's no getting rid of it. You know, might as well love it. But we have to actually allow that to soften and dissolve and reconfigure. So then stepping into the true self, which it knows itself is inextricable and interconnected with all things and allows the God, you know, the God force, God light, whatever you want to call it, just to move through us. And then our separate self reconfigures, you know, reconfigures into what, you know, Rabbi Gaffney calls our unique self, which is our uniqueness infused with our divine contact and connection. Mm. And then that's what allows us to step back into the world and experience life with, with God right there with us, you know, in every taste and in every kiss and in every sunset and in every prayer or every chant or every, it's, it's in everything yeah. if you're really there. And then being mindful of when you step back in the way as your separate self, lose connection, with mm. that source energy. And then that's where things get real squirrely, like you're talking about. Yeah. Because you're no longer being guided. You're no longer in the forest consciousness where things are just happening yeah. synchronistically for you. Actually, the source is going to be trying to actually destroy your path so yeah. that you stop it. So yeah. that you can get back into connection with, with source. Because that's what, you know, the divine wants. And that's, I think, what came through in our, in our little practice was that the light, the light wants to be seen. And this is also something that I've been, you know, in my study with, with Gaffney, it's something that we've been exploring is that there's actually a desire of the divine to be recognized mm -hmm. as, and of course, like it, it wants this infinite complexity of being known and recognized and having its way to experience life. And it doesn't mean it's judging us if they don't, but of course it wants it wants that. It wants us to step into our own divinity and it wants us to see the light in all things. It, it actually has a, has a sense of want. Like it, it does, wants yeah. It. it has a real serious desire. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big misconception of the divine, which is, ah, oh, the divine's perfect. It has everything. It does It wants it for no nothing. Desires, no yeah. desire. No yeah. desire. No, desire is fabric of the very universe itself. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Shekinah. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's desire itself. It's eros. Mm -hmm. And that, that changes, that changes everything because you feel the delight of the divine as you and beyond you when you step into those moments. And also you inherently, like me, I felt my own sad, it wasn't judgment. I wasn't beating myself up like, Aubrey, you idiot. You don't see the light in all things. No, it was just like yeah. the sadness of, wow, how often I see I see the mundane when the sacred is right there mm. underneath and I miss it. You know, I miss it all the time. And that sadness is, it's powerful. It's like a reminder of, oh, okay. It doesn't require a judgmental punishment. God, it's like, fuck, I want to see the light always because mm. the light wants to be seen and I want to see it. Right. But it's also just to bring back fourth way. And what I have found is that it's yummy today. Yeah. It's yummy that I can't see it all the time. And yeah. instead of like, I have developed quite a sense of humor about that. Like to me, it's not like, it used to be that I would feel sad. I also felt quite angry about it. Like I felt like it was unfair that I couldn't feel or see the light at all times. I, I wanted my, my hydrogens to just be in ambrosiac states at all <laughs> times. And I had very high standards. You know, I think it's, you know, it was imbued into me and I was reading all this literature that said that that was possible. And what I found was once I actually got that the totality of the human experience was that I was going to go out and in, sort of mm -hmm. like a shooting star, like out and in, out or and in. penetration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so I the stopped. The friction is actually the pleasure of it. Yeah, and I stopped the hating and the sadness yeah. around the out. Right. Instead, I observed the out and felt like, oh, look at little Biet. Yeah. In doubt. Or look at, oh, Biet. She's so yummily in envy right now. Yummy. <laughs> it's just funny to me. Like, I, I, I love it because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be human. Yeah. 
And I think my expansion comes from that that access and that pain. It, it is painful. One might even say it is kind of painful when you exit the light, right? Mm-hmm. And once you're in this state of flow and enlightenment, which it seems you are, what happens for me anyway, or the way that I would describe it is, is that you're, um, you're in and out of these states quite often, right? Yeah. So it's not like it used to be where it was like, oh, Mm. who am I? How right. will I ever get back <laughs> right. to the light? Like right. it, it doesn't feel so distant to me because the journey between those two states is no longer a journey because right. I have unified them within myself. To me, right. they are one. My enlightenment is the yummy marriage between that lost state and that found state. And so because I have married them inside myself, I am no longer of the delusion that I have to travel anywhere to get back to the other half of the same thing. I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm in half of the whole thing. My enlightened state is that I'm half dumb and half lost and half blind and half broken and half dying and half afraid. That's what makes me capable of experiencing my enlightenment. So why would I damn these things when they are the source of the yummy you know, mm-hmm. oh my God. Oh, I remember everything. I'm running with my tits in the wind <laughs> through the forest. Yeah. And like, I, I came to this planet, I'm living in my purpose. And oh my God, it's happening. That feeling, uh, you know, that's all like, it, it wouldn't happen without the other half. Yeah. Leonard Cohen in his, uh, in his song, Hallelujah, he talks about the holy and broken hallelujahs. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that is the human condition, the holy and the broken. And then can we see the beauty in all of it? And this is, this is exactly what you're talking about. And once we see the beauty in all of it, it collapses the distinction between beauty and ugly. Yes. In a way, because then it's just like, oh, this is the, the in-breath and the out-breath of the respiration of, of our existence. Yeah. And, and we chose this we wanted it to be this way and this is i mean i think alan watts does a brilliant job talking about this in his kind of little lecture about dreaming about if imagine if you could dream anything you want and ultimately you arrive at first it's all pleasure all the time (laughs) only pleasure only victory only success and then eventually you get to a place that's exactly like this yeah where just barely you know with (laughs) with the best of yourself you can step through and experience the magnificence, but the whole thing is the magnificence, right? It's the like whole thing. the whole thing. And, and we would dream this exact dream if we could. And that's what I believe we'd, we've done is we've dreamed the ultimate dream for us to have this human experience, both personally and also collectively, you know, and that's why when people get so pessimistic and, mm. and, you know, worried about the state of the world, like they're not wrong. Yes. And you're right. It's, it's a pretty interesting time right now. And all of the suffering that everybody's pointing to, it's all very real. And there's no spiritual maxim or truism or or whitewashing or any kind of Pollyannish words that actually make that suffering less real. It's very real and very painful and it's full stop and full stop. And this whole experience now gives us the opportunity to transform not only individually but collectively and just barely if we all bring our full heart and our full fuck you know then potentially we might make it through the other side into another era and into another level of consciousness fuck yeah and that consciousness is just to appreciate the consciousness we already have in many ways right Mm -hmm. but that is like another octave it's another octave of like deep appreciation of everything yeah, so much is born out of that suffering, just like in on in a macro, micro, right? So in your mm-hmm. own life, you've had suffering. I've had suffering. That suffering is useful to us. And so in that same way, the world is experiencing mass suffering. It also, you know, I always like to remind people, it has been experiencing mass suffering since the beginning yeah, of time. Like true, People right? are always like, oh, look at what's happening right now these yeah, days. I mean, and you I'm don't just have like, to go back too far to find slavery and to find oh, like yeah. a rampant, ab- I mean, yeah, sure. There's more work to be done in, with racism and with women's yes. rights and with gay rights and lots more work and religious freedom, lots more work. Not saying that we're done. No. However, Let's rewind the clock a little bit and see yeah. how much fucking worse it was. Witches getting burnt, quote, witches getting burnt. Yeah. People like the, the person who helped your father, basically. 
like yeah. there were they would get burned alive. Yeah, had to hide. A couple hundred years ago, you yeah. know, when the pogroms would come around, just slaughter families. You know, the Holocaust, the oh. I mean, the the unbelievable nature. And it's not that genocide isn't still happening, and I yeah. don't want I don't want to say that everything's all better now. But yes, generally, if you rewind the clock, mm-hmm. it was brutal, like yeah. brutal. And we're talking, and like people are talking about the tyranny of this potential government now. Like, yeah, try the church in the 1400s. Yeah, like you want to talk about fucking tyranny? Like, that's a whole other. It's a whole other level. You're like, I think the Earth is round and goes around the sun. Death, <laughs> you know, totally. it's like that's another fucking level. Of, that's yeah. another level of censorship and another level of tyranny, where it's not that you get deplatformed and then you know get to complain about it as on your way to Whole Foods. It's like no, it's fucking death. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that censorship. You know what I mean? Like, so the perspective I think is is important, and I, and I'm, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so. Your book has 44 different laws. Yes. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think are, you know, either from feedback from your readers or from things that you find yourself working with. Just a couple of these that you think would be really valuable to share with the audience. And of course, I recommend, you know, people get the book and read all 44 laws. Don't just sit there and and try to understand this whole map that you've created, which is beautiful. I mean, if you're going to give people a yeah. taste. It's the easiest book, too. So it's like, you know, you can read it like... It's intimate, yeah. It's But it's easy. It's like each chapter is like, I'm not here to confuse people. I'm I'm literally teaching Gurdjieffian wisdom, which for anyone who's pursued that, like, good luck. You can't read Gurdjieff books. They're ba- they're basically, like, unreadable. You can read Uspensky. He was a student of his. And you can read... Um, my favorite, which is Maurice Nichol. He's one of Gurdjieff's students. Um, but if you want something that's going to explain Fourth Way to you today in a language you understand from someone who has shopped at Barney's, like, you want my book. Like, my book is, it's basically giving you Fourth Way wisdom from, like, a much, much, much easier plane. So but that's not to say that the work won't require some effort on your part once you do it. But the 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 way that I translated is very easy. So I would say like one thing I'd love to share that's one of my favorite pieces of the the laws is is something that I have come to which is enlightenment, right? I I've created like a different form of enlightenment or a different perspective. We've talked about it a lot inside this episode, so I think it's be a good thing to share. Mm-hmm. So the idea is like enlightenment as I don't know about you, but for me it was always taught to me as like you, you know, you study and you work and you blah, blah, blah but then you f- finally, you hit a crystallization of the state, the state we were in together yeah. earlier, right? You hit a crystallization and then you're just in that state. You just stick the landing. Perpetually. Yeah. And not only are you in that state perpetually, but everyone knows it. And <laughs> everyone wants to be around you and like around your cock and around your tits or whatever <laughs> gender yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. And they just want to like make altars in your favor and golden statues to like commemorate the crystallization that has happened that you, this totally flawed human, have now transcended all your flaws, desires, needs, and setbacks to now feel no feelings whatsoever, ever, but to only feel a state of ambrosic enlightenment forever, right? So that's kind of what I was sold. I don't know about you. Mm -hmm. And even my teachers, you named many of them, you know, Alan Watts and Castaneda. Like, no one really said, by the way, this isn't 24 hours a day. Like, just that wasn't the messaging. And so for me, I want to bring to the world a different messaging around enlightenment so people can just fucking relax a little more. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think this level of, like, I will get there, this masculine thing you were talking sure. about earlier, right? Like, it's like, I will win the enlightenment game. And again, what do you get? What do you get when you win the enlightenment game? You get to, like, come down the holy mountain and have everyone worship you and, like, whatever, you know, be on the cover of New York Times or whatever, you know, as, like, mm-hmm. the most enlightened person. So I created a wheel to describe what enlightenment actually looks like. And the, my idea is that enlightenment is a, is a state that is always churning. So once you reach enlightenment, which you do kind of have to reach enlightenment to have the churning begin. You have to taste it. Yeah. But once you taste it, 
you FYI can't go back. So for anyone who's listening, who's like tasted it and your life has gotten worse since then, it's like, that's because once you taste it, time starts. It's like almost like the Mm. clock doesn't start running until you taste enlightenment. Once you taste enlightenment, the duty unfolds and the task has been set before you. And if you're not listening to that, if you're not rolling with the other parts of the wheel, you're going to feel pain. And it's going to feel like pain. It's going to feel like uncomfortable. It's going to feel discomfort. And then maybe there's going to be shocks, car accidents, deaths, fires, like you name it. I went through all of them, like (laughs) most of them anyway, right? So, so, okay. So imagine a clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock is enlightenment. So that's that moment where you're like, the, the world is filled with light. You're Hildegard von Bingen. You remember the meaning of it all. And that's the enlightened state. Then we move to three o'clock. Three o'clock is creative flow. So it's where you are tasked to create. This could be a business, a podcast. It could be a book. It could be a tarot deck. It could be a new uh, business style, like something you're doing in the world. It could be a marriage, a relationship, whatever. Creative flow. And that requires some action. While that action may be creative and it may feel very like, you know, expressive, it's still action. You're not just sitting in a room like vibrating from an an orgasmic enlightened state. So you're doing some shit. And and by the way, if I've been in those states where I'm vibrating in an orgasmic state, you know, my path has been the plant medicine path. So that can warp you into these states, you know, especially if you do it in the right way and, and you really understand your consciousness and you can actually use these tools in a good way. And ultimately, if you're in there for 5, 10, 15 minutes, you're like, God, I miss being normally human again. This is too much. This is too much. I'm not built to hold this all the time. Like, I'm so happy. Thank you. Mad gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And get me me, me the (laughs) hell out of here. Yeah. And then also when you're in creative flow, you got to tap out of there. Like when I'm writing, you know, I score my, I do these mass meditations all over the world. I score them with my own music. When I'm writing a record, like I literally feel like my hand is in a socket and I'm like being electrocuted. I'm running out of the room to write down melodies, to write down lyrics. It's really intense. If I was perpetually writing records, like I would be fucking exhausted. I'm not Bob Dylan. Like I just need, like I need breaks (laughs) in between. Right. And so So I put my hand in the socket and creative flow. You want to get out of creative flow too. That's why the beauty of the enlightenment wheel, which I've created, is that it moves. You go from one place to another. And and then also each part I consider enlightenment today. Whereas I used to be like, how will I ever get back to that feeling? Today I'm like, they're all part of that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's just almost like inertia. It's like the enlightenment is like a a bomb going off or like a big bang. And then the life that comes out of that. Yeah. is what happens. So the creative flows next. Six o'clock, you're gonna you're gonna love this one. It's accomplishment. It's it's like all the stuff you don't want to do. Cold calls, spreadsheets, networking events, like forums, like things that have nothing seemingly to do with enlightenment. But how do you think that someone like Rumi got his shit published? Like he didn't just sit at home. There's that theory that like we just sat at home feeling enlightened all the time and someone found us. And they found us. And then they were like, you're the one. That's not going to happen. Like, wake up, people. No one's coming to your door. It doesn't matter how enlightened you're feeling. No one's coming. You have to do the entire thing yourself. So, and by the way, by yourself means with everyone around you, right? Like, together. But you have to leave the house and go meet with people to go do that, right? right? So that's six o'clock. And then you get to nine o'clock. And nine o'clock is humility. So nine o'clock is where you, like, hit your face to the floor. Everything you try fails. You get rejection after rejection. You feel like all this work you did on the the enlightened feeling you had was for nothing. You're just a useless piece of crap and you're going to die. What is the point of this whole thing? Uh That feeling. And then you fall to the ground. You put your hands in prayer if you're me and you say, fuck, I can't do this without you. Please, please help me. Please help me. And in that humility, that point of complete remembering that of yourself, you are nothing, that without God, you are nothing. You are bestowed upon with light and you remember yourself and you get back to in line. Mm -hmm. And so the wheel begins again. And so to me, like I feel humility often. I don't know about you, but I get like, I get a nice dose 
all the time now. Yeah. I used to think like humility, like I'm going to, you know, avoid. But it's like it says, you know, Teresa of Avila, who's an awakened teacher, wrote that humiliation is the first castle that you have to enter to get into your soul. Humiliation. That's the first castle. So to me, it's like every time I'm humiliated or I feel ashamed, like I was ashamed the other day and I did my somatic practices around it. And at the other side of my 20 minutes of somatic practices around this big shame I felt around saying something to someone next to a van, um, I was guided to my next work, my artwork. Like I was, I was downloaded a message. It was like, you have to paint these things and they have to be this way and this has to be involved. And I was like, okay. The transmission is inside the humiliation. It's inside the humility. So today, I just don't see that as other. Yeah, that's a. It's such a beautiful, such a beautiful map, and to understand it's, it in that way. And I think these maps are really important. I've spent some time recently, and I'm still young on this path. You know, even though my ancestry was, you know, Jewish. You know, yeah. I, ultimately, I didn't understand anything about Hebrew wisdom until this past year, until I met my teacher. Mm. And so <laughs> we've been looking at the Sphero, the tree of life, the Kabbalist tree of life. And <laughs> some, and again, my apologies to Kabbalist scholars who, who understand this a lot more than me, but I can't help but think how, you know, what I've been studying recently also provides this very kind of interesting map as you understand it. And I'll do my best to, to kind of, uh, explain a little bit of this map and how this map has helped me because it's a lot of the concepts we're talking about. So that three o'clock energy that you're talking about, this creative flow, this passion is on the, the right-hand path of the Sphero and the Sphera is Chokmah. And Chokmah is like, like you see, you're t- almost touched by the divine and you know that you have this energy that wants to pour out with Telos with a direction, but you don't know exactly what that is, but you just know that you're here to, you're ready to create. And then Bina on the other side, which has the line that goes across in a balance, and those two are in in balance on the left and right-hand side. Bina is all the logistics. It's everything you've been talking about. The spreadsheets, the what are you going to have the block and tackle, Mm. the how are you going to actually translate this artistic expression into something that's actually manifest. So that's the top-level relationship of the balance between the two. Step down. And there's chesed, which is the overwhelming love and desire that cannot be contained, Mm. you know, and just, you cannot contain it. You're just filled with love and and desire for life. You just want to fuck life open, right? Mm. And then there's din on the other side, boundary, discretion. Mm. Maybe we shouldn't actually fuck this person or this this thing. there's, There's discretion, there's boundary. That's necessary. And both of those are actually the complementary, you know, kind of sphera that hold each other in balance. And then uh, you go down, you know, one more and it's, I believe it's Yisak and Hod. And Yisak is like, you're in the, in the triumph of your experience in this kind of like, this is the best night that I could ever have. This is the best experience. This is the best creation. This is, I, I did it. I did it. And then there's hod, which is, and now it's done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's time to go to bed. It's time to, you know, put the book down. I've created what I can create. And it's time to start, you know, start the path again. And then in the middle of that is to ferret, which represents to me in my understanding. Of course, there's many interpretations. And again, I don't want <laughs> to ruffle any feathers of people who understand this potentially better than I do. But Teferit is our inner king or inner queen, which is the harmony of all of these different, you know, opposing forces that are not opposing, they're actually complementary, but it's the harmony that actually creates the beauty. And it's the beauty of our life and the beauty of our path. And it's all contained in our, in our kind of, in our inner king or inner queen, I think is the best way to actually articulate it in a way that that I feel it in my body and understand it. And then of course, above and below there's, you know, Keter, which is the crown, which is our plug in, our direct plug in to source. And then there's Mahut at the bottom, which is our brokenness. So that's our holy, holy hallelujah and our broken hallelujah. And of Mm -hmm. course I missed a couple of Sphira in there that I don't quite understand (laughs) so much quite yet, but I'll get there eventually. But 
it's been a cool map to see how when you actually dive in these maps, they all, they all kind of, they're all pointing to the same thing in a different way. And that's, I think, how you can really start to trust the path is that when you go deeper, Sufism and, and Kabbalah and Rosicrucianism and Gnostic, you know, beliefs and, you know, Mahayana Buddhism, they all have different different maps that each have their own unique beauty and value and treasure that's contained in it. Yep. But they're all kind of saying the same thing yeah. in a lot of ways. And it's, uh, it's just, it's really beautiful to encounter your map and your wheel. That's also then all of the ways that it applies to all of the other maps is like, ah, oh, fuck yeah. It makes total yeah. sense. Well, that's very high compliment to my map, right? If it's like yeah. matching with the, the maps of, because I got them from there anyway. I'm not like, I'm not reinventing any wheels. Right. I just happen to have remembered the one thing that's going on here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And that's, I think it's also, you know, and I've done, you know, ayahuasca quite a few times. And the, one of the interesting things about it is there's a part of the ritual is the sharing ceremony. The ceremony is it's often mm. called after the, after the mm. ceremony. Mm. And it's so rare that anybody shares anything that isn't a full resonance. Sure. You know, that the medicine has given them something that's in full resonance. And actually, when somebody shares something that isn't, what I've learned is that that's actually, it's important to actually not try to gaslight their experience or try to change it, but just to check in with them and see, because there's, there's dangers in the, in the psychedelic medicine path too. Dangers of inflation, yeah. you know, dangers of instability that could be revealed in the psyche. And so most 99% of the time, it's like full resonance. You're like, wow, what an amazing insight translated through your own unique vessel in a way that I could never articulate it in a vision that I would never get. And so thank you for that. And then if it's not, if you don't resonate with it, it's like an interesting moment. And I've seen where those times where something didn't resonate, some other, some crack, some, some kind of challenge, some shadow kind of got magnified sure. in an interesting way. And so it's been you know, it's been interesting. And I think we can apply that to not just the ayahuasca setting, but just with, with our teachers too. And with any kind of setting where we're deeply invested in interacting with somebody's work, when there's a point where there's like a, a felt sense of dissonance, it's, it's good to pay attention to that For because sure. I think we all have the truth that lives within us. And I'm sure there's great quotes about the truth that lives within us all, you know, but I don't have any of those right now, but it's, it's a, it's a eternal truth, right? Like the truth lives You're within us. You're making them. Yeah, exactly. And when, when something appears that doesn't quite feel right, like don't override that and don't get lost in adulation of the being or the person. If like, if it doesn't feel right, like pay attention. Totally. You know, like listen to that. Amen. Yeah. Same as within yourself, right? Of course. We're all part of one thing. Yeah. So. Of course. What else from the what else from the laws? You know, if you just kind of allow naturally that that to come through, connecting to all of the people that are going to listen to this, and is there anything else that kind of rises to the surface as, as something you'd like to share? Well, since you're so into Kabbalah, I mean, one of the key laws of Fourth Way is the Law of Seven, mm -hmm. and the Law of Seven says that everything in the universe runs on octaves. Mm -hmm. So nothing can be born or live or be created without an octave. And an octave is eight, but the eighth is a return. So it's do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. Do is the beginning and the end, right? Mm -hmm. And so in my book, I have one of the chapters is the law of seven. And it explains... Um, it uses the framework of success. So for anyone who's looking for success in their life, just to know how success actually works, the law of seven is inside of success, just as it is inside of anything that is born or created. Mm -hmm. But let's look at it from the framework of success. So do, re, mi is um, an idea. It's like where you're like inspired. You're like, oh, I'm going to go write a screenplay or I'm going to go make a bakery shop or whatever. And most people never get past do re mi in their life. And, you know, it is a sad tragedy of life that do re mi's die 
a sad death pretty quickly for most people because they don't have what it takes, which is what I would call universe or God. They don't have that force behind them. And so Doremi actually can't be taken anywhere without that force. Mm -hmm. And Doremi is just inspiration. It's just an idea. And um, then you hit the first interval. And the first interval is called, it's just a pause. So if you look at a musical scale, it's just a pause. But the first interval is in the work, it's difficulty, minor difficulty. So for instance, if do, re, mi for you was like, I'm going to become a vegan. Mm -hmm. So the first difficulty would be like, you're at a friend's party and they're serving these amazing burgers and they look really good and they're like bacon and the, there's a bun and you were trying to do keto and yeah, like yeah, paleo yeah. and vegan and you're like, I'm going to do this. And then you were tempted by these burgers and, you know, maybe you've been vegan or paleo or whatever for two weeks now and now the burger has appeared and you're like, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah. So that's it. And that first interval, whatever it is you started in Do Re Mi has the chance of being squashed. Now, if it's something bigger, like a screenplay, let's say, you, you know, you write the first few scenes and then you get busy. You have kids, you're bored, you, you, you want to watch porn, whatever like people mm -hmm. are doing with their lives, like people just get distracted. And so the work teaches that we need to have tools for that first interval to get through the first interval. Then comes Fasola, and Fasola is called, I think it's ambrosia and station. I'm forgetting the exact verbiage that I use for this, but station and ambrosia, basically. And it's like where you got past the first interval, and now, you know, you're further along. Maybe you finished the screenplay, and now you're like sharing it with, you know, Susan Sarandon or whatever, you right. know? Right. Um, so that is Fasola and Fasola is a beautiful state. And, and I use in the book, the cupcake shop analogy. So like at this point, you've created a cupcake that's so unique that there's maybe like a block or like a line around the block mm -hmm. to get a cupcake. Maybe you've been written up in the local gazette, right? Then you reach the law of impossibility, which is called the second interval. Second interval says just because you reached station and ambrosia doesn't mean you get to reach completion. Completion is only for the few. So can you make it, right? So if you watch any film, they use this part, the seven love seven diorama to tell the story. Like the hockey team, they're losing, they're losing, they're losing. Finally, they win. But it's not the end of the movie. Then the main player like gets hit by a bus mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. you can like if you know the formula of films you know that three you know fourths of the way through jenny gets can't like aids or whatever right yeah. so there's this shock and the love and possibility in our lives looks like your house burns down you get a chronic illness you get diagnosed with you're gonna die you um you know someone you love dies your family member like a shock and um, and it prevents you. Like, I can't go further. I know the cupcake shop is working, but I can't go on. I can't take it to the next level. And so when that happens, you know that that's the sign that you need even more reserve. You need more tools. You need more practices so that you can get in touch with that alternate plane. From the work, fourth way work, the beginning of my book talks about the cross. And the idea is that the cross is this ancient symbol, which was adopted by Christianity now. But before that, it was an ancient symbol that symbolized this work. And this work says that there's a horizontal plane and a vertical plane. And the horizontal plane is like where you built the cupcake shop, where you got the investors to invest in the cupcakes, where you bought the eggs, blah, blah, blah. That's all on the horizontal. But on the vertical is the energy for that. It's the invisible light, the feeling that you really know how to make cupcakes and you want to share them with the world. And the desire too. like one of the things I teach in the book, and this is at the end of the book, is this idea that in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it says that time runs in all directions, right? So if I really am the creator of a really special cupcake shop, it's not just me that wants these cupcakes. It's the millions of people who've now eaten these cupcakes in the future right. saying, can you please make me these cupcakes? Because right, right, in the future, right. I'm going to want to eat them. And oh my God, Biet Simkin made these cupcakes in the past, mm. right? Or like Shakespeare, like he wrote these works of genius 
Was it him or was it the millions of people that have since performed the work, have on stages, have had their lives changed by Shakespeare, have taught, you know, college seminars on his work? I believe that the desire of those people flooded his pen and wrote the work Mm -hmm. for him, right? So here we are in this law of impossibility and to get through that, you're going to need that spiritual juice. And if you do, you get to Cedo. Cedo is completion. And Cedo is, you know, you see when you see someone in Cedo, it's Oprah. It's like, it's someone who's really like living an embodiment of having gone through those walls and said, I know what to do here. I know how to surrender here. I know how to bow down and disappear here so that this whole thing can happen, the whole thing. And in the cupcake shop, since we're talking about the cupcake, it's like, not now your cupcake shop burns down, but instead you rise up and you create a philanthropic mission where your cupcakes are now 50% of the proceeds go to feeding the hungry and, you know, oh. where, wherever there's hungry people. That's, that's different. You know, not only now is your cupcake the most famous cupcake in the world, but you're also, you know, a multimillionaire and you're helping starving children somewhere, right, you know? Right. It's, uh, I never really thought about it, but, you know, the seven is absolutely, it's part of the musical scale. And and it's not like we invented the musical scale. No, or it, the rainbow. Yeah, it exists. Well, there's seven colors in a rainbow. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> uh, we didn't invent that. No. We didn't, we didn't invent that, right? It's, it's, it's been there. It's like part of the Tao. And in the, in the, in the Tao Te Ching, it says the Tao is older than God, right? It's just like part of the structure of cosmos, you know, and, and there's a way that the Kabbalists would describe it as Shekinah, you know, like, which is like kind of like the Tao, but it's this, this force mm. that's, that's underneath everything. Yes. That's underpinning everything. And the fact that we have a seven day week, well, you could think that as like arbitrary. Yeah, fuck it. Somebody was just like seven days or there was a deeper listening and a knowing that actually we're on this seven day cycle of following this musical scale and then returning back to a, mm. you know, potentially another octave again another micro octave or yeah, yeah. potentially regressing to a lower octave mm. temporarily mm. flushing out you know any great symphony mm-hmm. goes to the higher octaves and the lower octaves and it creates over time you know this masterpiece of your life of your story yeah. you know and so yeah it's really kind of reified made real for me this idea of seven and uh, and that's also really cool. In addition to this kind of another model of a s- almost simplified model of the hero's journey, mm-hmm. in a way of like how to understand the story in these intervals yeah. that you have. It's beautiful, and it's also like I love that math and music are the secret of the un- like they're the universe speaking. Right. You can't break those, right? You know, and then that movie. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Pie by Darren Aronofsky. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you remember that Life film? Life of Pi? No, no, no. It's older. It's a black and white film. Um, anyway, I don't want to ruin it for you because you should totally see it. But okay. it's a black and white film about this guy who has the secret of the universe, the math equation that is the secret of the universe in his head. And so the, all the Hasidic Jews are trying to like come and get him because they want the secret from his head. And so like he's running from these... Hasidic Jews through the movie and in Brooklyn. And it's just, it's funny, but also like very, yeah. very moving. And the end of the Getting film is... chased by Hasidic Jews is not as scary <laughs> as, as some other, some other pursuers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, uh, oh, yeah, Hasidic no, yeah. Jews again. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're kind of funny looking with their yeah. big hats and stuff. They're, they're kind of comical. So it is, a, it's kind of a funny film, but it's also yeah. beautiful. And the last scene is very, I won't ruin it for you. But something happens where he's like, I need to do something so that they can leave me alone. Mm-hmm. And so he does something that he can, so that he won't have this. But this, that, that, that the secret is a mathematical equation. Right. Is what moved me about that film. Like that Darren Aronofsky was like, yeah, I'm going to make this film about that there is a mathematical equation that is the secret of the universe. You know, and the same thing with music. Like when I listen to certain music or when I write certain music, I feel like, oh, this is the secret of the universe. You know, mm-hmm. like it's, or in cinema where it's all coming together, visual, music, numbers, story, myth, all put together. Like it just feels so 
Mm. Yeah. Lucky. Indeed. Indeed. And, uh, yes, it's just, I'm just taking a moment to just feel how many different times and things in this, in this, uh, in this podcast, it's just kind of open and clarified, you know, different, different aspects of reality, which is, which is, uh, obviously gorgeous. Um, when I was doing some research on your meditation techniques, it seemed to me, and so this is slightly shifting gears a little bit, but it seemed to me that it was borrowing a bit from, you know, what I understand of Vipassana meditation, where it's, you know, focusing on breath and a point, a, like, like taking a point of focus. Mm. And is that typically, is that typically the style? Now, obviously we did it with eye gazing, which is it's kind of its own genre and technique there's some so much more that's happening be, even though we are focusing left eye to left eye so there is that quality yeah it's a little bit different yeah very eyes different. are you know it's it's a different yeah. it has a different flavor and fragrance so when you're just teaching meditation which you're you know the ideal being that you can get to 30 minutes a day yes like talk to us just technique like what have you found because i'm sure you've tried many different things i've you know i've learned you know kind of a, a mantra technique from emily fletcher and it's been really powerful oh. yeah emily's amazing she's lovely and uh and you've been able to work with her and got my own personal mantra word and you know oh. did the whole ceremony and the whole thing and it's very powerful and again it's that is focusing your attention on kind of that one thing and nothing, which is the mantra, which you allow to come through you yes. on its own time and in its own accord. And, uh, and but this is just a different, it's a different way that I've had some experience with, which is focusing visually in some ways on mm -hmm. a point. So, so just talk to us about that technique and why you like it and, uh, and, and what you feel is really powerful about it. Yeah, I mean, I've studied uh, TM or whatever, the Vedic tradition as well. And I've also yeah. studied Vipassana. My work is neither of those. Mm -hmm. I would say that my work hinges on what is called divided attention, which is a fourth way tool. And the idea behind divided attention is to presence yourself to many different senses at one time. So you would, for instance, follow your breath. And then you would also see the beauty of the room around you. Mm -hmm. And then you would also focus on a point, which if it's a person, very emotional to look into someone's eye, but right. you could do that. That's opening up your emotional center. Right. Then you have another focus maybe on some music, mm -hmm. beautiful music, ideally conscious music. Mm -hmm. So listening to, for instance, like the cello suite by Johann Sebastian Bach is, mm -hmm. I find, very helpful. Slayer, not not really the idea can be good in it, in, it, in it. that's an anger meditation i teach which oh, yeah. i do yeah and i have that in, in my upcoming course anger meditation i teach uh -huh. so that's very helpful um but this one is just divided attention and you can do it anywhere like you can do it if you're in a car you're just your hands are on the wheel your breath is always one of the key components your body noticing the senses in your body noticing the temperature of the room noticing the surrounding beauty around you and then trying to then float above yourself like a filmmaker and see yourself from above mm -hmm. who are you and what do you look like while you're doing all of these things and if you can divide your attention effectively between all of the things at once something very strange happens not always but something can enter it's a possibility that something will enter so divided attention is a tool. Self-remembering is the ambrosiac state that occurs if you actually allow it to work. Right, right. So this is, I've, I've heard this referred to as like a five senses meditation where you're really trying to expand basically the, the bits of information that come when you're actually fully conscious with everything that's happening. There's so much. Yeah. For it's it's almost it is actually I think if you look from a neurological perspective and I've heard some people analyze this like if you actually pay attention to everything your brain cannot doesn't have room for additional thoughts and other things to right. come in it's it's at its maximum processing capacity at that's the true. conscious level so the subconscious can process far more than the conscious mind can and that's why it drives so much of our action I think but in this making everything radically conscious it just actually crowds out the room for 
you know, the way that our mind can wander and get distracted. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're adding the final bonus, which is the seeing oneself from above. Yeah. Which is where the, the I think the crux. Have you ever met someone who's like trying to pretend like they're in a present state, like at a party, and they're like, "Hey, oh yeah, yeah, yeah." It's the worst, right? So the, <laughs> what they're doing is they're doing fascinated attention. What they're fascinated with is you, but true self remembering comes from seeing yourself. So if mm-hmm. you saw yourself going, "Hey," you'd probably <laughs> start laughing. Right, you right, know, right, right. So the goal of self-remembering and the goal of divided attention is to see what do I actually look like when I'm out in the world? Mm-hmm. What do I look like when I'm talking to my partner? What do I look like when I'm doing a business transaction? Like, do I look like what I think I look like? Or mm-hmm. am I actually present? And when you presence yourself and do the divided attention, you can sometimes see. And if you're lucky, you can get a nice dose of like what a loser you're being or, <laughs> you know like yeah, you can get it sure. you just, and then you get that and you can reel it back and rem- and bring bring in that forest energy like you were talking about yeah you make a choice but you uh, can't make a choice if you don't see yeah oh it's like oh, i'm being kind of you know it's you know one of the things that was actually came to me yesterday uh interestingly enough although no synchronicities i suppose was and i've and i've felt this throughout for a lot of my life because I had a there was a time where I did more journaling than I do now um I, there was time when I was more emotionally tumultuous and I've had my own adventures in love and romance and unrequited love and then mm-hmm. polyamory and then all kinds of different things so I was journaling a lot and and which is incredibly helpful when you're going through a lot like journaling is unequivocally one of the best techniques Super that we good. can do but what I recognize is there were certain times where I was writing I and then certain times where I was writing you, hmm. like, you gotta, you gotta do this. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna blah, blah, blah. So I'd write in second person hmm. in my own journal. I was like, what am I doing writing in second person in my own journal? Begging the hmm. question of who is the me that's writing, that's telling me, other me, and giving me advice. And yeah. oftentimes, I think in the, in the basic level, that is what Freud would call the superego, hmm. which is the kind of judging, critical, but sometimes encouraging coach. And I I prefer to call that rather than the judge, the coach. It's like the coach, like get in there, like you got this, <laughs> you, you know, this, or yeah. you're a fucking idiot. Like what is wrong with you? You know, yeah. like either way it can take a dark tone and coaches are like that too. Coaches are kind of observing and judging and we can actually move our identity complex, like, a, like where we focus our identity to that superego point, the, the coach. Yeah. And we actually feel like we are the coach and we're talking to ourselves. And it feels like that pre-configures the higher witness perspective that you're talking about, which has a sense of neutrality and yes. also underlying universal love. You know, it's the loving awareness that Ramdas talks about, right? Yes. It's like, and and actually the coach pre-configures that in a way. It's just filled with the passions and judgments and and you know everything that it's gotten from default reality. But in a way, that's like pre-configuring what this witness is, and and just. I'm sharing this to help people recognize that we've probably all talked to ourselves in the second person all the time. And so we are actually used to becoming the witness of ourselves. But there's a higher there's a higher articulation of that where we're actually witnessing with non-judgmental universal love. Amen. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that new, you said it neutrality. It's like the sattvic state. Yeah. Right, we want to enter in. If you want to find enlightenment you can't enter it through positive or negative. People think, oh, well, if I'm really like positive, it's the law of attraction. I got to stay positive. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, you need you need positivity and you need negativity. But if you want to enter the, the state where you're actually remembering who you are, you need to enter through the sattvic state, which is neither positive or negative or both of them at the same time. Yeah. So it's like kind of like I do a, a meditation where I look at one hand and I fill it with all the grace and all the beauty and all the perfect. And then the left hand, and I fill it with all the ugly and all the flaws and all the things I'm ashamed of and all that. And then I find the place in my center, which is both, which holds both of those. Like what part of me is an embodiment of both of those. And that's who I like to go to. Mm-hmm. That's who I like to bring to parties. You know what I mean? Like I'm not... Totally. <laughs> is it i think this idea of consistently trying to be 
you know, sunshine, rainbows, and butterflies. It's exiling a truth about ourself, which yeah. is we got nasty, murky, swampy aspects. Yeah. And if we're trying to just be one aspect of that, then we're actually teaching ourselves judge, judge, self judgment and also repression. You know, that's the meta context for that, which judgment and repression has nothing to do with enlightenment or spirituality. Actually, it's actually the antithesis of it. So as you, yes, it's great to be all of these things, but there has to be this almost non-dual appreciation for the entirety of yourself, which yeah. is the integration of the shadow. It doesn't mean that you have to act out on all of these things, but just to recognize all of these attributes and hold them without judgment. And then actually when you do choose to be positive and you do choose to be loving and you do choose not to be angry or whatever that is, it's a real choice because you yeah. recognize that it's there. It's not this that you're, oh, I'm just good. You know, it's, yeah, I'm just good. Yeah. Like, yeah. Who's good? <laughs> yeah. It's that, no, I'm good and I'm bad. And I'm going to choose right now to express my goodness yeah. and like, and strengthen my goodness. And that's, that's a heroic move. Yeah. It's a heroic. And then you can start to feel good about making that heroic choice. But if it's not a choice, because all you are is, is butterflies and rainbows, are you really good? Or are you just operating on the momentum of what you've inherited and learned and and what you've suppressed and so there's there's only real power and power in a good way like personal power in actually holding the entirety of yourself and like you said both hands and then finding yourself in the center and then choosing which hand that you want to lend energy to mm. yeah and also yeah. not being afraid to be like that whole person yeah so like people like I used to feel like I was really bad and I was going to get found out. But that's when I was trying to pretend like I wasn't this other right. part of me. And so once I accepted that there was these other parts of me and they were not leaving, it was just like, OK, well, you know, yeah. I'll just fucking take our fucking panties off and <laughs> hang out, you know. And I feel like that today. I feel like I'm at a party, like when I'm at a party, I feel like I'm in my pajamas and I'm just yeah. chilling. Yeah. It seemed to me that there's, it's almost necessary to actually feel your own badness in a way. And, and again, that's loaded term because of, because of the judgment that's already applied right. to it, right? So right. your darkness, whatever. But again, it's loaded. All these terms are loaded. It's difficult to talk about mm, this without the polarity mm -hmm. already being applied. So that understood but it's like it's important to actually feel that and allow yourself to feel that rather than to suppress it because if you suppress it it comes out in in like closet viciousness so what i've seen is somebody suppressing that they're fucking pissed off right yeah. end of a relationship and, and i see this in you know spiritual communities end of a relationship someone's fucking pissed actually and maybe justifiably so honestly and but they're like, you know, I just, he or she, they're on my altar and I'm just sending them love and sending them love. And I'm like, <laughs> but meanwhile, there's a viciousness to the, yeah. to the gossip and what they're actually saying about that person and spreading poison hmm. amongst the group about that person. But all they're saying is, you know, they'll just, without even realizing, like consciously, like, no, I just send him and her love and I, I wish them best along their path. But their, their viciousness and anger hasn't actually been acknowledged and allowed mm -hmm. to breathe. So the viciousness comes out in, in spreading poisonous stories and, and opinions about that person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Because yeah. that, that, that anger is going somewhere. It's just going inward or it's turning in internally and then it's attacking yourself. But that, that has to like, it has to live somewhere. And so in that moment, and this is, is a recent example, encouraging that person to find the fuck you. Yeah. You don't even have to say it to the person, but just yeah. find it in yourself and find the anger. Like, fuck you. That was bullshit. You know, I did not deserve to be treated that way. So fuck you. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. And then from there, okay, good. Totally. Got that out of the way. Now I can put you on the altar and send you love <laughs> and light. Like, like you have to almost step mm. into and allow your allow your darkness, shadow, badness 
to live and breathe and exist. For sure. And then you can actually choose a different way. I agree. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, you can also get stuck in your darkness, badness. Because the other thing about darkness, badness is there's a pleasure associated with darkness, badness. It mm-hmm. feels good to be angry. Actually, in a way, it's painful in some ways and caustic and harmful. Mm-hmm. But there's, you feel it. It's this like rush. Yeah. This rush of energy and That's power true. that comes through in this. So there's a pleasure yeah. in that. So I think you can also get stuck just being like, I'm I'm bad and I'm going to express my badness and it's fuck you to this person and fuck you to that person and fuck the hater, fuck this. And you get all like in this, but really there's a deep sadness because you haven't, you've, okay, you're including it. Good. Step one, but you have to also transcend it and include the other aspect of you, which can choose a, an even better way. And, uh, and that's been like a really, and, and I, and I'm expressing this externally. Like it's all my friend, you know, everybody always talks about, oh yeah, you know, my friend, like this but it's a personal it's a personal journey too it's like feeling my own badness my own darkness and then i remember at one time i was in my own badness darkness recently and yeah i've got real comfy with that you know like real comfy with that and one of my other teachers uh dr john churchill who's on this kind of mahayana buddhist path you know he talks about like you know his form of enlightenment with like with the buddhist would, would worship the and actually not worship but have images of these tankas, which is like where, what he calls the demon and the Buddha meet, you know, so this Yamantaka, the death fucker with his erect phallus and his mm-hmm. kind of demonic and angelic nature. And that's what everybody was trying to realize their darkness and their, mm-hmm. and their goodness at that point where it was meeting. So I was getting real comfy and cozy with my darkness and my, and my badness. Mm-hmm. And then I expressed it privately. Yeah. And I was like, huh, I didn't have to do that. Mm. Like, I didn't have to do that. And actually, it didn't feel good anymore. I see. And it, so it was like, almost like I allowed it's, myself to yeah. feel it, to feel it, and then yeah. go like, oh, yeah, that's, that didn't feel good anymore. It's a razor's edge, though. It is. Yeah. It not. is. It's like, this is, <laughs> no, this is, this is, this is the journey. very far. You can't go too far in any direction without leaving right. Right. the premises, and, you know? And that was the that was a big realization moment that now I'm on a different swing where there was a mm. swing where I had to go reclaim sure. some of my exiled darkness and now like reclaimed one step too far. And fortunately yeah. it wasn't disastrous. It was a private, petty judgment that I allowed to express mm. to like a really good friend. Mm. And nobody will ever know. Right. But you but I but I felt it in that yeah. moment and, and he knows too. But he he did you know, I don't know, we're we're homies and there's not like, we're not judging each other. Right. But after I was done, I was like, damn, the fuck was that? Like, I get it. I get that there's that badness of me, but I don't want to be that. It's not my story. No, it's not my story. My story is a different story. So now I'm on like a, a upswing of my goodness. And I'm like the goodness. I know I'm bad, but now watch my goodness go. <laughs> you know, yeah. like let's go team goodness. I'm fucking in it. Yeah. And it feels more authentic than my goodness has ever been. That's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's how it should feel on right. the other side. Right. I think that we get that as the, that's the reward when we're willing to go that direction. And you'll know when you need to go there again. Like, because yeah. it's kind of like a cup, it gets full. And you need to pay, you need to tend to it. It's a garden. So right. it, it'll get full with resentment and pride and rage and and you'll 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 know when it's time to face it again, and when you face it, there will be a certain period of time. You know, in the work that I teach, there's also grief meditation, mm-hmm. which is just thirty seconds a day of grieving. Grieving, like for me, you know, like I have a daughter who's four. I have another daughter in my belly, like right as we speak. But when I gave birth to Cash, my last kid, um, I felt this great sense of. Uh, responsibility like I had kind of killed her right Mm -hmm. because she's gonna die one day I'm hoping and I I think pretty I feel pretty certain that she's gonna live a very long life let's say she lives till 90 but she's gonna die (laughs) Mm -hmm. and like I'm the reason that that's gonna happen because I birthed her right so like I I inherently murdered my child by giving them life if it wasn't for me giving them life with God and my husband together there would be yeah. no death. So I'm responsible. 
And so that, when I do grieving meditations, which are 30 seconds long, I just meditate on the grief I have around her death, even though it's going to happen far beyond my own death. Like I, I won't be here for it. Makes me incredibly sad. Sure. Especially if once you have a kid, which I think you're going to do sometime soon, like you'll see it's the most excruciating love you've ever, like you'll ever feel. You feel so much love. It's so much worse than any love you'll, you've ever felt <laughs> mm-hmm. because you love them like you're nuts. They make you nuts with love. Mm-hmm. It's, be- it's beautiful. I mean, it's shocking. Mm-hmm. And so like with her, it's like the thought of her ever having to go through anything, pain or death, is so painful to me. So I do that. 30 seconds, I feel it. And then I imagine that a light being, you know, I choose like a conscious being like Jesus or Buddha to hold me in in their arms and just let me have that grief. And then I like caress myself and just let myself feel it and move on with the day. But there is a rabbi, I think it's Rabbi Nachman, who said that if he would do that at 12 midnight every night, he would give himself 10 minutes to just feel the despair of all of the world's pain. The all the things we talked about earlier, how horrible things are on the planet and mm. the the famine and the impoverished state of 70% of the world living on this planet, all the pain. And he would let himself feel it, grieve it for 10 minutes a day. And he was like, if I don't do that for 10 minutes a day, it builds up and then it infects the rest of my life without my permission. So like I see grieving meditation and anger meditation as a way that I allow myself to be part of what's actually going on here. But because I have a space where that happens and a way and a form and a function and a modality for it, it doesn't get corrosive and just like in the middle of a Sunday when I'm trying to enjoy my life with my family, all of a sudden I'm like in some deep melancholic state because they're all going to die one day. Or a mild (laughs) sustained melancholy. A 5% melancholy. Right. Numbness. Just, just a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where I'm just like, I don't feel anything. I don't right. feel anything. I'm <laughs> right, fine. Right, I'm right. fucking fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's painful. Like, I'm going to die. She's going to die. He's going to... Like, fuck, man. They really set us up for some shit here. You know, like, if you find your person, which we both have, fuck. Yeah. What are we heading towards? Who's going to go first? Who's going to hold whose hand while they die? If we make it, the best case scenario, yeah. we stay together forever. We love each other till the end. It's like, then, ouch. There's something that's so, it actually undermines the suffering when, they're, when you know somebody is with you in it. This is compassion with yeah. etymology, with suffering. And this is Mother Mary energy. As, and, and again, I, there's lots of biblical interpretations which kind of inoculate mother mary energy but as i felt it actually felt it it's the fiercest compassion and it comes through my sister caitlin in a a really strong way when she enters kind of a a, a trance and she'll we have a particularly potent relationship where it comes out frequently you know around me and what i feel from that is i feel a compassion that's willing to feel all of my pain all the pain that i've ever felt and all the pain that i ever will feel which is what you're talking about and the fact that she's willing to feel that and not only feel it but exaggerate it almost and right. say like you're going to feel this and i'm going to show you how not alone you are how you're always you're always with the capital m mother Mm-hmm. As expressed through me at this current moment, but don't get confused. It's not me. It's the capital M mother. And the mother is willing to feel not only your pain, but to amplify your pain to show you that you're never alone. You're never in uncharted territory of your own suffering and your own pain. And then at that point, it's deeply moving, of course, but then you mm-hmm. feel like, oh, I'm not in this alone. Because mm-hmm. being alone, lavado, as, as it says in the, in the old text, right? Lavado, being alone is one of the most painful things. But if someone's with you the whole way as you're already with your kids in their suffering, right? This is this mm-hmm. is divine mother. This is like, no, like mom's here. Mom's here no matter what. She is. And that's so powerful to have that, you know, to have that embodied and to know like, all right, mom's here. You know, and, and father energy is more like, it's going to be all right. 
you're going to be in another body. This is just the way it is. You know, like, you'll be all right, son. You'll be all right. You know, you'll be all right, my child. It's it's different than mother energy as far as I understand. And yeah. of course, these, you know, mother, feminine, masculine, mother, father has its own challenges and right. misconceptions. But to me, there's there's just a different fragrance to it where mother energy is like, no, no, my son, my daughter, like, I'll feel it with you. Yeah. I'm right. I'll feel everything. And then the father is the telos, like, don't worry. You know, this will pass. You'll turn, you know, they'll, this is only a stage and this is helping. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's like moving you out of it. Whereas mother's like, don't worry. I'm going to stay right here with you as long as you want. As long as you want to feel it, I'll feel it with you. And I think both are necessary. And, and as if we can encounter that at all in our life, represented by a person, fucking great. Cause then that models what we can actually access in the great beyond in the in the actual full expression of that archetype in the archangel expression of that archetype or the the divine expression of it and i think it's just beautiful that you're already modeling that for your children Mm -hmm. and i know that you also have and as we both we all do and i don't know your your husband i'm sure he has plenty of both types of energy as well but i know also see the the telos and the father energy that moves through you as well like and it's going to be all right Mm-hmm. Like, I'll feel it with you, and it's going to be all right. You know, this is just one station on this long journey of the soul. And uh, and that's, in my mind, the best we can give our kids. And also to remind our kids that, and this, again, I don't have kids, so I don't, I don't know, but what I feel is and what I would want, you know, is to just express, like, don't get confused. Like, I'm your, I'm your dad, but I'm not the father. The father is the father's far bigger than me. And I participate in the father as best I can. And mom participates in the mother. And we actually both participate in mother and father in a certain way. But it's not us. So don't get all confused and twisted and worried about us. You know, and when we fail in participating in father and mother, mm-hmm. and when you see me fall, and mm-hmm. you see my brokenness, don't project that brokenness onto the father. Right. Don't project my brokenness as a mother onto the mother. Like, no, that this is just my brokenness. This is Aubrey's brokenness, Vailana's brokenness. And you're going to have your own brokenness too. But if you, and if you really want to get the, the real thing, the full, the full ride, you know that we're just participating in it as best we can. Amen. Amen. This has been such a beautiful conversation and so beautiful just to be in your presence and, uh, and be able to, to share this. Thank you so much for coming in person. I can't imagine trying to do what we did today on, <laughs> on uh, Skype or something. No, I can't either. It wouldn't have worked. No. It wouldn't have worked. Um, where would you like to point people to if they're excited, allured, interested, curious? You know, we've obviously mentioned the book. Um, yeah. where, else, where else can people go? Uh, the book is a good place. I have a website which has lots of information. I'll have a course coming out soon. And uh, Instagram, which is good. It's at Guided by Biet, which I'm sure we're going to like align there when we share all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So they'll already know about that. Um, yeah, of course, I also make music. So if anyone's interested in using my music for these meditative practices, um, there, there's some records on all all the channels, Spotify, Apple, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And so much love to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere. And leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.